Paul says, I don't want your faith to be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. One of the greatest demonstrations of God's power in any generation is through answered prayer. In the movie War Room, Miss Clara is showing Elizabeth her wall of remembrance, all these answered prayers that have happened in her life. And that's not just a prop for us. That framed photo that says answered prayers is covered with true answered prayers that have happened in our lives and in the lives of people that were on our set. In our office here at Kendrick Brothers Productions is our wall of remembrance. And each one of those photos is a depiction of God's power at work, a true miracle that happened in our lives as a result of answered prayer. We saw in our parents, them coming together was an answered prayer. Uh, Alex, while he was in college, was asking the Lord to help him to one day make films that would impact people for God's glory. Our dad was praying that his three sons would be working together one day, and now we're running Kendrick Brothers Productions. Uh, Miss Clara's house in War Room, finding Karen Abercrombie to play Miss Clara, facing the giants, even hitting theaters was a string of answered prayer, a bunch of miracles that came together for that to even be a reality. We were praying as we were working on Courageous that God would allow men around the world to be impacted by this film, to help them to step up and be the leaders of their homes, to provide for their children. And so we got this photo from Malawi, Africa of men who had seen Courageous holding up their own resolution saying, I'm gonna take care of my family. I'm gonna protect my children. That was a huge answered prayer. For us, this is not just theory or artistry. This is real life. We are hoping that people through the movie War Room will get to know God on a personal level and that they'll become a prayer warrior and begin to experience his power, his presence, his love on a regular basis. And their lives too can be a demonstration of the power of God. If you have your Bibles, uh, I want to invite you to turn to John chapter 14. If you don't, then uh, I'll read the passage aloud if you just want to follow along. Uh, I grew up in a home where we saw answers to prayer in my parents' lives, as, as I just talked about on the video. And I remember my dad felt God leading him to launch a Christian school, and this is in about 88, 89. And uh, he didn't have the books, the lockers, the facilities, uh, you know. And, uh, but we saw the Lord answer one prayer after another, provide the location for them to launch the school. Another school contacted them and said, we're shutting down. Do you want our books and our lockers and these things? And we just saw God launch this Christian school. It's still going on today after like 27 years, uh, Cumberland Christian Academy is still uh, serving churches in the Marietta area. And so, but I remember one time when, um, this was I think in the 90s, my, I walked into my dad's office and he said, I'm praying for um, this one campus. They wanted to expand the middle school campus and they were gonna bring in one of those modular units, you know, where they set it up on blocks and they put the ramp in and they connect it to the facilities. And, and he, said, uh, he said, I've been praying and uh, it's gonna cost $7,000 to do this, but we don't have the money. So um, a married couple comes into his office and sits down and they say, how's the school going? Do you have any needs? And he said, well, we're trying to expand the campus over here and you put in this modular unit. And uh, they said, well, how much, how much do you need? And he said, I'm praying for $7,000. And the husband's mouth drops open. He looks at his wife. He said, well, my wife's father just passed away and we had this inheritance come in and we've been asking God, what do you want us to do with this? And he's been directing us and he prompted us to bring this to you. And he reaches in his pocket, pulls out a check, already made out for $7,000 to the penny, and he puts it on my dad's desk. So he didn't come the year before, and he didn't come the year after. To the penny, right when it was needed, we saw the Lord guiding in that decision through answered prayer. When we were launching filmmaking in Albany, Georgia, we didn't have the cameras or the money or the equipment or the training or you know any of those or the experience, but the Lord was leading us in that direction. And uh, people donated $20,000 and we used that to make our movie Flywheel, our first film. And uh, we started off with, Lord, 
We don't know what we're doing, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, and you can supply all of our needs. So would you enable members of our church who have no acting ability to, to act, you know, and to, and to try to help us pull off this movie? And we didn't know what call sheets were, production schedules, location, man, we didn't know any of that stuff. We basically pulled up Microsoft Word, you know, as we're typing up the script, and, uh, and our church members were trying to support us, you know. You fast forward, every one of the films have basically been a string of answered prayers, one after another. And you get to the point when you see the Lord responding like that, that your faith wings begin to grow. And you begin to believe God for more. You know, it used to be $20,000 was a big stretch for us to pray for that. But then you begin to see more and more that there is no limit to our God, you know. He, if you ask him for something, God is never intimidated by anything that we ask for. He never is caught off guard or never thinks, well, that's too tall in order for me, you know. Uh, the father in the book of Psalms asked Jesus, he said, ask of me and I will give you the nations as an inheritance unto you. So the father is prompting Jesus to pray big. Does that make sense? And so tonight when we talk about prayer, um, the way that we pray bigger is when we discover more and more the heart of our Heavenly Father. The more we know God, the more we realize, oh, that's not a problem. He can handle that, you know. And He's not only powerful, but He's very good. And the, the more we've grown in our walk with the Lord, we've, we've just realized God is, is a good, loving Father. So I wanted to share some passages with you because God wants you to have a vibrant, healthy prayer life. He doesn't want you to view prayer as this boring religious chore, as a burden. He wants you to view prayer as a blessing, a privileged opportunity. If I was handing my, I have a 16-year-old son named Grant, and we just got him a cell phone recently. He wasn't like, no, I don't want a cell phone, you know. I don't, I don't want to be burdened with the, with, the, with, with the burden of having to talk to people. No, he was like, give me that, you know. He was excited about it, being able to communicate. Prayer, we ought to view prayer as more important than our cell phone. That we are delighting to talk to our Heavenly Father. If, if you eat ice cream and you really like it, your brain releases something called dopamine that gives you this good feeling. And it actually rewires your brain to want to go back and get that again later on in the future. So when we experience something that's good or pleasurable, our brains kind of rewire to say, go back to that source again, pull out that Mayfield ice cream and get some more, you know? Uh, in the future, you begin to crave those things. When we find refuge on our knees, you're burdened, you're stressed, you don't know what to do, you get on your knees, you cry out to the Lord, and His peace comes over your heart and mind. You begin to rewire your thinking that I need to go back to this place when I'm stressed and burdened and I have a need again. The Lord wants to wire us so that we, like David, physically long to go spend time with the Lord because we found peace in our hearts and in our minds with Him. And there's times when I'm stressed and I'm burdened and I physically feel compelled. Of, I want to go, I need to go get along with the Lord. This is too heavy for me to, to bear. I, I, I need direction and I don't know what to do because consistently I have found that he's faithful when I seek him. So in John 14, it talks about Jesus is speaking and he's talking about a couple of reasons why God wants to answer prayer. Is it in your thinking that God wants to answer your prayers? Because the truth is, he didn't send Jesus to die on the cross to tear the veil from top to bottom, to cover you with his blood, to open up the way for you to approach the Holy of Holies through the blood of Christ in your time of need just so he could say no to you. He has done all of that to create a way so you could have an abiding relationship with your heavenly Father in heaven because he wants you to talk to him. And so in John 14, Jesus gives us some reasons why God wants to answer our prayers. And here's the first one. If you look in verse 13, he says this, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He says God is glorified when we have a need and we pray and God answers that request, God's glorified. 
he goes public with his power and his goodness when he answers prayer. That when he shows up and meets that need, you're like, wow, God, you're awesome. That's amazing. Prayer is one of the things God uses to silence the skeptics and the atheists and the critics and the false religion leaders. Because think about Elijah. He used answered prayer to differentiate between a living God and a dead God. And when you have answered prayers in your life, when you get right with the Lord and you're walking with him and you pray and God answers, it separates all the other people who have an argument, but they have no evidence of God's power. So for you in your life, God wants to answer your prayers so that he will be glorified. Does God want to be glorified? Absolutely, because the Father is glorified in the Son when we pray through our relationship with the, through, through Jesus to the Father, we have access to him, and when he answers through, his, through our relationship with him, he's glorified, and salvation through Jesus is glorified as well, and God wants that to happen. So it, that's chapter 14, verse 13. It says in Isaiah 43, 7, everyone who is called by my name has been created for my glory. You have been created for God's glory. And then in chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus said this. He gives us another reason why God wants to answer your prayers. He says, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And so he says, when God answers our prayers, our joy is made full. He repeats that thought in chapter 16, verse 23. He says this, in that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that, what does he say? Your joy may be made full. God wants when we pray and he answers our joy to fill up and overflow out of us. Right. That's the same word for, the word full there is the same Greek word used for when Mary broke the ointment and the house was full with the fragrance from the ointment. It's the same word used for when the disciples are pulling in that giant catch of fish and the nets are so full they're breaking. So think about this. Jesus says, I want your joy to be that full. It's bursting out of you and the house is filled with the fragrance of your joy. Have you ever had God answer a prayer and you were so blown away and excited about it, you're walking in to talk to the next people and you got to tell them about it. Oh my goodness, here's what happened. I've been praying for this for so long. This just happened to me. Alex and I were praying uh, on the set uh, of, of each of the films that God would draw people to salvation. We have a relationship with Sony because they're distributing our movies, and there's a lady that Sony assigned to be our connection point between us and them. And we began to pray back in 2014 when we were making the movie that God would draw her to salvation. So we've been praying in, in my prayer closet. Her name is one of the ones I've been praying for her salvation. Well, in January of this year, we were on a mission trip and this email pops in our inbox and it's from her. I haven't heard from her in a while. She said, oh, by the way, I need to tell you something. She said, when I was working with you guys on War Room, I began to hear about answered prayer and hear about God. She said, I began attending a church and my husband and I have now been baptized. Now Jesus is in the center of every one of my decisions. And you know what, when she sent me that email, it was one of the best emails I've ever gotten. Alex and I were bursting with joy because of the answered prayer of what God did in our lives. So one of the reasons Jesus wants your prayers to be answered is so that your joy is made full. That you're, it's not connected to the world's circumstances or the economy or who's in office or what the stock market's doing or anything else. But the, as you're praying, God's answering and your joy is made full. That's one of the reasons Jesus gave us for why he wants to answer prayer. There is not an issue you're facing that prayer cannot address because God, a willing, loving God, is on the other side of each issue. God has already provided everything necessary for you and I to have a vibrant and successful prayer life. First, through salvation that we come to know Christ, when we repent of our sins and we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we enter into that relationship with God. God goes beyond being our creator, and now he's our loving father through Jesus. But secondly, through his Holy Spirit, he's prompting us to pray. Now, let's all be honest. Our flesh is in opposition to the things of the Spirit of God. 
It says in Galatians 5 that your selfish, sinful, and my selfish, sinful, lazy flesh is in opposition to whatever God's Spirit is leading me to do. So God's Spirit is prompting me to pray, and my flesh is like, I don't want to go do that. You get down on your knees, and you're, you're trying to pray about something, and your body's saying, this is uncomfortable. <laughs> you're trying to focus in on God's Word and to surrender to Him, and your body's saying, I'm hungry. Or why don't you go check your Facebook? Or don't you have a lot to do today? And you begin to come up with any reason your flesh is not happy about being in a surrendered, humbled state before Almighty God. So we need to recognize that, that, that when that happens, we have to be following the Spirit of the Lord and not what our own physical body is telling us. And so Jesus said in verse uh, this is chapter 15, verse 7. This is one of my favorite verses about prayer in Scripture. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, when I began to study this passage, I knew that God answered prayer, but this is, this is a mind-blowing verse because of what Jesus is telling us to do in our prayer lives because it goes beyond what you think. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, I, then you can ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So I want to give you a few principles from Scripture tonight. And, uh, and here's the first one. The first one is to pray first and foremost. Pray first and foremost. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, therefore, I exhort you first of all, of all the things he can tell Timothy to do, he says, first of all, he says, let there be supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority over you, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, now he's telling us how we can pray, for there is one God and one mediator, the bridge between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. And then he says this, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Paul says, here's the first priority in your life, prayer. Now, Jesus didn't say my house should be called a house of praise, even though it is. He said, my, he didn't say my house should be called a house of programs. <laughs> my house should be called a house of preaching. Thank God for preaching. He said, my house should be called a house of what? Prayer. prayer. Why? How good is the preaching if there's no praying going on? How good is the praise if there's no praying going on and you're not getting your heart right with the Lord before you praise? How good are the programs if there's no praying going on? How good are the outreaches when there's no prayer going on? How good is the fellowship when you're not praying with each other and for one another? But if you prioritize prayer above all of those things, if the people are praying for their pastor on a regular basis, how good is his preaching now? How good is the evangelism when there's prayer going on now? How good are the leadership's decisions when prayer happens first? Prayer is the wind in the sails of every ministry of every church. And when churches aren't praying, suddenly we're having to manufacture with human energy and our own business professionalism to try to things make, make things look good and make things executed, but there's no power. Because in Scripture, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is connected to the prayers of the saints. And when believers are surrendered and right with the Lord, and they're asking their Heavenly Father boldly before His throne, you will see consistently in Scripture that the power of the Holy Spirit shows up when the prayers of the saints are active. And so we can't set Peter free from prison, but when they, when they begin to fervently cry out to the Lord in prayer, the God's Holy Spirit steps up and sets Peter free, which, which no political organizational effort could have done. So pray first. We, prior to, we put it first in order. We tend to make it our emergency parachute when everything else falls apart. And after all of our efforts fail, then we're like, I guess we'll pray now. Has it come to that? <laughs> it's this, you know, prayer doesn't need to be the spare tire. It needs to be the steering wheel. Driving our decisions. Before you make major decisions, we must pray. Before we confront the evil, we must pray. 
Before we try to seek God's wisdom in his word, we must pray. Before we do anything, we must pray. My, our business meetings go so much better when we pray first. I can tell the difference. There can be contention and confusion, and it's like we're spinning our wheels and we can't solve problems. And, and then when we pray first, though, and we surrender the meeting to the Lord, it's like the wisdom of God steps into the room and the clarity of God and the direction of God and all these things start falling into place. Have you ever had to confront somebody about an issue and it all came untangled and unraveled? And have you ever been in a situation where you began to seek the Lord first before you dealt with an issue and he had already gone before you and given you favor and softened hearts and helped solve the problems even before you got there? So we pray first. Paul says, pray first. Jesus spent all night praying before he chose his 12 disciples. Before Esther went before the king, what did she call the people to do? We got to pray for three days first. And so the battle was fought in prayer first, and then they stepped into the victory that God was going to win in the, in the physical realm because of how they prayed. So we pray first. Before Jesus did anything, his private habit was to rise early and pray. As his popularity exploded, he would often slip away to pray. His first fully recorded sermon, explain, sermon explains the fundamentals of prayer. Before going to the cross, he gets alone in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays. He sends his spirit, a spirit of intercession, prompting us to cry out, Abba, Father. And as, I, as high priest, he ever lives to make intercession for us. So what do we see in the New Testament? We see a priority of prayer. Acts chapter 1, they're meeting in unity, praying. The Holy Spirit comes. Acts chapter 2, they prioritized the reading of the word, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers, funneling energy into all of those things. Romans chapter 12, Paul says, be devoted to prayer. Colossians 4, be devoted and devote yourselves to prayer. In the book of Acts, when the, when the widows were being neglected, they set up the whole system of the deacons and sent them because the apostles said, we must prioritize prayer in the study of the Word of God. They guarded that priority, and they wouldn't let, any, let anything else take it. The best decisions were made in prayer, and the worst decisions were often made without prayer. How did Joshua defeat Jericho? He was on his knees before the captain of the Lord's army, the Lord, receiving the strategy. But the next chapter, he goes after Ai. And remember, he's God's man, carrying out God's will to take the land, but he didn't seek the Lord first before he went after Ai. And even though he won a victory yesterday in Jericho, today he's defeated. The very next chapter, he makes a covenant with the Gibeonites. They're, he's deceived, and it says he was deceived because he did not seek counsel from the Lord first. Just because we've had victory yesterday, just because we've had successes last year, every church is one unprayed over decision away from God taking his hand of blessing off of you and you making a bad decision. All of us are one pray, unprayed over decision away from making a covenant with the Gibeonites like Joshua did. We must always prioritize prayer before we make any major decision. Anytime you do something new, pray first. The new day, Lord, I'm giving day, the day to you. The new year, the new baby, Lord, this baby, I'm dedicated to you. The new job, Lord, I want to honor you with this new job. The new car, Lord, I want to honor you with this new car. The new house, the new relationship. We launch everything and we birth everything in prayer, so we pray first. Secondly, we pray connected and clean. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. So for you to abide in Christ, you must know Christ. But secondly, abiding is about intimate fellowship. It's staying clean and close in your relationship with the Lord. So we must be in fellowship with Christ. Jesus says, he uses the illustration of the branches. That when we're abiding, we're relying upon him. Many churches don't talk that much about prayer or the reliance of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus basically explains that Christianity is about that reliance abiding relationship with Christ. Too often times, we tend to default in a, in a version of religion and it's basically try harder and do better. When you're failing, just try harder and do better. We hear a message, men, you should love your wives like Christ loved the church. Man, 
I better try harder and do better, you know? You know, evangelize your community. Man, I'm not doing that. I better try harder and do better. But that's actually not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is repent and rely. Now think about this. The, the analogy Jesus used in John 15 is of branches to the vine. Now think about if, you, if there's a branch that's not producing fruit and it's cut off and it's severed from the vine and it's laying on the ground. And we wake, walk up to that branch and we say, you're not producing fruit. Husband, you're not loving your wife like Christ of the church. You're not winning your community. You're not making wise decisions. You're not bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You need to try harder and do better. Oh, it's not working. Well, all right, well, let's gather and surround this branch with other branches that are producing fruit, and let's talk about best practices, you know. <laughs> and let's come up with, let's have a focus group and talk about a book, you know, that's, that's a New York Times bestseller on how to try harder and do better. No, biblical Christianity is not try harder, do better. That's a man-centered version. It's repent and rely. I'm turning from self-sufficiency. I'm, I'm not leaning on my own understanding. I'm not relying upon myself. I'm becoming poor in spirit, spiritually impoverished, and God is my source. And I'm turning to him, and I'm relying like a branch reconnecting to the vine. And when we rely in an abiding relationship with Christ, what happens? His Holy Spirit pours out love in my heart and gives me a love for my wife that I didn't have before. He begins to speak to me about the sin that's in my life I need to repent of. He begins to guide my decisions. Fruit shows up when I'm relying on the Lord. If you abide in me, he says, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Repent and rely. Should we try harder and do better? We should repent and rely and then step forward by faith. And then God begins to do things through us that we couldn't do on our own. So if you look at John 15, just to summarize, I'm going to go quickly through this. How do we abide in Christ? Here's a few things connected to abiding. One of those is staying clean before God. No bitterness. If I have bitterness in my heart, I'm not in an abiding relationship with the Lord. Jesus says in Mark 11, when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. Men are lifting their holy hands before the Lord without wrath or doubting. Paul says, I want the men, those that are spiritually responsible for their marriages and their families and the church, I want those with the spiritual authority to be lifting holy, I want them praying everywhere, lifting holy hands before the Lord without wrath and doubting. I'm forgiving anybody I'm upset with, and I'm trusting the Lord with holy hands before the Lord, and I, he said, men everywhere. And I cannot help but think about Moses in the Old Testament when they went after the Amalekites. And when his hands were lifted up, they were victorious. And when they came down, they were defeated. And so when men, especially as the spiritual leaders of their marriages, their families, their homes, are doing what the Apostle Paul says, and he says, I'm not going to wait my wife, for my wife to be the spiritual leader. I'm going to be the spiritual leader like Jesus has commanded me to. And I'm going to step up and say, we need to pray about that. <laughs> And we need to pray before we try to solve that problem. And we need to pray for that need to be met. And we humble ourselves before the Lord. Men, you want to have a more romantic relationship with your wife? Prompt prayer. You lead in prayer and let her see you humble yourself before the Lord. And God will give, you, give her a deeper love for you and a deeper trust in you because she sees you're not a man trusting yourself, you're trusting in the Lord. So we pray clean and we abide in the Lord then, it, then we stay in the Word. This is part of abiding is staying in the Word. We stay in prayer. We walk in obedience and we walk in love. These things are connected to an understanding of what abiding in Christ is about. I'm remaining in close fellowship with the Lord. I don't want there to be anything in my life that would grieve the Holy Spirit and cause me to not be in an abiding relationship with the Lord. Because now I'm not going to be able to bear fruit. The love and joy and peace of the Holy Spirit is not going to be flowing in my heart and through my life if I'm trying to muscle it forward, but I'm out of fellowship with God. So every day we should, we should be seeking, I want to stay close to you, Lord. I don't want there to be anything between me and you. So how do we do that? We're, in, we're clean before him. We're in the word on a daily basis. We're praying on a regular basis. We're walking in obedience to what he tells us to do, and we're walking in love. 
Jesus says, if you're, if you're obeying me, he said, here's my commandment, love one another. So throughout your day, you need to be viewing yourself as a conduit of God, an ambassador stepping into, into a situation, and you need to be thinking in, in your mind, how can I love on the people at work? How can I love on the people with my family? How can I love on the person that I'm talking to you right now? And if you focus in on that, that is part of that abiding relationship with the Lord, and God will begin to bless other people and lead other people through you. And then we pray bold and we pray big. In John 15, 7, he says, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. James 4 says we don't have because we don't ask. But we are to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Ephesians 3 says, in Christ we have boldness and confident access. People tend to pray wimpy, small prayers. And and the, the, the word is saying pray big and pray bold. Be bold when you're approaching your heavenly father through Christ. So let me give you four levels of praying bold. Here's level one. It's asking for what you need. Level one is asking for what you need. Matthew 7 says, your heavenly father knows what you need before you ask. So if you have something you need, are you praying about it? Is there anything right now that you need that you're not praying about? Because scripture says, if you have a need, ask God for it. You don't have because you don't ask. What is a need in your life that you're not praying about right now? What is something you're worried and concerned about right now? Are you praying about it? Because the Lord wants you to be praying about it. Secondly, it's asking for good things. Asking for good things. I'm sorry, it's asking according to God's will. Forgive me. Level two is asking according to God's will. First John five says, this is the confidence which we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request. So I'm asking for my needs. Here's level two, asking for God's will. So when you're praying about something, ask yourself the question, what will greatly advance God's kingdom in this circumstance? What will greatly glorify God in this circumstance? What will line up with his word? What will line up with the great commission? And then you can be specific as you're praying, as you're praying according to what you know already lines up with the will of God. Here's level three, asking for good things. Asking for good things. Jesus goes beyond needs, and in Matthew 7, he says this, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give what is good to those who ask him? Now, this is going beyond needs. Did Hannah need a son? No, she didn't. But she asked for a good thing. And she was right with the Lord. Did Jesus need to curse the fig bush? No, he didn't. But he cursed the fig bush and it withered to the ground and God was glorified in that circumstance. He used it as a way to teach about prayer. Psalm 84 says, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. So, is there something that may not be a need but might be a good thing for you to ask for? If it's not a sinful thing, it's a good thing. Pray about it. Come to the Lord and pray about good things. So sometimes you need to be thinking, when I think about my marriage or my family or my work or my friends, what is the most loving thing I could ask for right now? What could I pray for that would be overwhelmingly good? Because if God is good, and he is, and he's preparing good things for us, and he is, then we need to be actively seeking and asking for the good things. So we need to pray very loving prayers. We need to cover every situation in prayer and ask God to bless and provide and be glorified as much as possible. Because he can do more than we can ask or imagine. Because his glory is the ultimate goal of all praying, not to mention it's a great, the, 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 one of the best defenses is a great offense, and when we're asking for good things, it's counteracting the evil. So don't just pray against divorce. Pray that you have an awesome marriage. Don't just pray that your kids stay out of jail or stay off of drugs or graduate from high school or go to college or get a job. Pray that God conforms them to the image of his son and that they advance the kingdom of God 
and that, that, that wherever they go, that whatever they touch, that God is being glorified in their lives. Flood evil with good. Romans 12 says we are not to be overcome by evil, but we are to overcome evil with good. And when we love someone, we want nothing but the best for them. So John says, I'm praying for you. I pray that in all things you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. So when we're praying for things and covering things in prayer, I like to think, what are the good, really good things I could ask for in this circumstance? And here's level four praying. We ask for what we need. We pray according to God's will. That's level two. We pray for good things. And then we ask for our heart's desire. John 15, seven says this, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, the Greek there says, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The phrase there actually means your heart's desire. Now I grew up hearing you can ask for what you need but you can't ask for what you want. And I was like, okay, well that sounds holy and noble and honorable. And then I read John 15, seven, Jesus says, if you're in an abiding relationship with me, that I'm your greatest delight in your desire, you're right with me, you've confessed and repented of all sin, and you're receiving my words, my words are abiding in you. In that context, he says, I can trust you then to pray for your heart's desire. Now we see this theme repeated throughout scripture. So I wanna give you three examples of it. Here's the first one, Boaz. When he woke up and sees this noble, honorable young woman, and she's sleeping at his feet, Boaz gave Ruth a blank check. He said, I will do for you whatever you ask, for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. So a wealthy man looks at Ruth, and in that context, she had turned her heart towards him, was walking in honor and integrity, was a servant-hearted, honorable woman. She was not a Jew, but Boaz was so moved that he said, I will do whatever you ask of me. Solomon, what did he do? He takes over the throne. He leads the people to build the temple. When they build the temple, they sacrifice to the Lord. He gets on his knees and he worships the Lord. His delight is in God. And what does God do next? First Kings 3, God says, ask what you wish for me to give to you. He, God gives Solomon a blank check because his heart is right with God. And Solomon asks, if you remember, wisdom. And the Bible says it was pleasing in the eyes of the Lord what Solomon asked for. Now here's a negative example of this, and it was King Herod. Do you remember when the, his stepdaughter Salome comes in and dances before him? He, a lost, pagan, selfish man, was so delighted in her, he said, ask for whatever you want. And she asked for the head of John the Baptist. In all three of these circumstances, though, the person in the authority position with the resources was delighted in someone under their authority, and they chose to give them a blank check. This passage, John 15, 7, is a parallel to the Old Testament passage of Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you what? The desires of your heart. The word in the Hebrew there for desires is actually the word petitions. I am praying, I'm delighting first in the Lord. And in that context, he looks down and he says, you're not walking in sin, you're not walking in selfishness, your delight is in me. And we're saying, Father, what would you have me do? I want what you want. And then he says, well then, what do you want? that we have that kind of relationship. He's a loving father. So when our delight is in him and we're serving him, Jesus says, we can ask for our heart's desire. First Timothy six says, he richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. You know, he could have made food just necessary and tolerable, but he made it nutritious, not only nutritious, but delightful and delicious. And we all have fingers that smell like barbecue chicken tonight because God made food delicious. He could have easily made everything taste like dirt, but he's a good God. Not only did he make the universe functional, but he also made the universe beautiful. Then he gives us eyes equipped with 3D high definition, automatic focus, self-cleaning lenses 
that can see a billion plus colors in panoramic real time, positioned on a pan and tilt image stabilizing neck. Because he's a good God. He could have made the universe beautiful and not give us the ability to enjoy it. So God didn't just create strawberries and honeycomb and then tell us to only ask for turnips and asparagus. God is not an impoverished, distant dad who only lets his kids ask for socks and underwear for Christmas. He says, delight yourself in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. So at Kendrick Brothers Productions, you know what we do? When we're praying, we pray big. We say, Lord, we belong to you and everything we have is yours. And you're the reason we're here, we're here. And we want to glorify you with our lives. And we want to impact the nations for your glory. And Lord, we're asking, would you give us the storyline for the next movie? And Lord, would you make it entertaining and heartwarming and touching? But would you give us a message that will change people's lives and take the gospel to the nations? Lord, would you send us a cinematographer who will help us shoot beautiful shots? And would you send us the right composer who will write uh, anointed melodies? And Lord, and we just go on and on and on. Anything good in our heart's desire, we pray for. Now, God can say no to whatever he wants to. He said no to David when he asked for the baby to not die. He said no to Saul when Saul said, would you take away this thorn in my flesh? And Jesus is saying, let this cup pass for me. But I don't want it to be because I didn't ask. So whatever your heart's desire is, you hit the ball in God's court and let him do what he knows is best. But don't let it be because you didn't ask. So if tonight you had a dream and Jesus showed up and he handed you a pad of paper and a pen and said, everything you write down on this pad of paper, I'm going to give you. Would you just say, oh, Lord, just bless me. No, you wouldn't. Line by line, you would fill up every page of that pad of paper and you would say, here's my heart's desire for my children and here's my heart's desire for our nation and our president and here's my heart's desire for our pastor and here's the heart, my heart's desire for my marriage and here's my heart's desire for evangelism and the church and here's my heart's desire, you know, you would fill it up. That's what your prayer life needs to be like. Get busy, get your heart right with the Lord and get busy praying big and praying bold to a father who is not intimidated by your request. And then we pray specifically and patiently. It will be done for you, he says. When will it be done? In God's perfect timing. Now when George Mueller died, he had 50,000 documented answers to prayer in his life. 5,000 were answered on the day he prayed them. He's praying and God's walking in the door with the answer. Which means 90% of the time though, it was the next day or the next week or the next month, the next year before God answered because God's timing is perfect. So when you ask for something, if God doesn't respond right away, trust his timing. Keep on asking and keep on trusting. George Mueller said, do not let yesterday's seemingly unanswered prayers stop you from praying in faith today. The book of Luke starts off with Zacharias, an old man in the temple, burning incense, and the angel appears and says, Zacharias, your prayers are, have been answered. Your wife's going to have a son. At this point, Zacharias is an elderly man. In his back pocket is Israel's AARP card. And his wife was not only barren, but now it's double whammy. She's past child-rearing years, even if she wasn't barren. And Zacharias is thinking, I didn't pray that this morning or last week or last month or last year. I prayed that 20 years ago. But Zacharias, this is God's perfect timing because John the Baptist in your mother's womb needs to kick when Mary walks in the door and Mary may not have even born, been born when he prayed that prayer the first time. God's timing is perfect. So we pray, George Mueller said, 
there was a man, all these answers to prayer, but there was one man, he was, he'd been praying 63 years for this man's salvation. And when George Mueller died, that man still had not come to Christ. But he said, before he died, he said, I know the heart of my father that this man will come to the Lord. And when Mueller died, before the funeral service started, that man had given his heart to the Lord. So he didn't see it in this life, but he trusted God's perfect timing. We need to be the same way. So we pray specifically and we pray patiently. Jesus said, it will be done for you in God's perfect timing. We pray specifically. Alex prayed specifically for a Panasonic Vericam HD camera when we were shooting Face in the Giants. And when our cinematographer showed up on set, he had a Panasonic Vericam HD camera. I don't even know what that was. But he was praying specifically. When my wife and I were moving into our house, we had 26 specific things we were praying for. We started off by saying, Lord, what do we need to pray for in our house? And we came up with a list of 26 good things to pray for. And God led us to a house, and it had all 26 things that we were praying for. It was, it, we love for people to come to our home and to tell them that story about, look at what the Lord did. You don't have because you don't ask. So what about you? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, he says, ask what you will and it will be done for you. Are you right with the Lord? Do you know the Lord? And if you do, do you know that your father has prepared the way for you to have a vibrant, healthy, joyful prayer life? And he loves you and he's saying, ask me. Because when you ask for good things and for God's will and for your needs and for your heart's desire when you're right with me in that context, he says, when you ask, then the Father is glorified and the Son when I answer. And your joy is overflowing. It's made full. And God's joy goes way beyond anything this world could offer us.